Welcome to the World Nomads podcast, delivered by World Nomads, the travel lifestyle and insurance brand. It's not your usual travel podcast. It's everything for the adventurous independent traveler. Do you want to know which is the very best part? The Spanish bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. La Livia, the little Spanish enclave in the middle of France. Who would have thought? It's true. And we'll hear more from Mark. He's so funny. And his partner, Kate, on the Enclave shortly as we explore France. France, bordered by Belgium and Luxembourg in the northeast, Germany and Switzerland in the east, Italy and Monaco in the southeast, and Andorra, where I've been, tiny place, and Spain in the south and southwest. Most of France's land borders are delineated by the natural boundaries, you know, the uh, geographic features that are the Pyrenees and the Alps. All right. You're saying France. I'm saying France. Well, should we go there to dance or to dance? <laughs> I'd go there to dance. What okay. would you do? Go there to dance. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> how, can we, how can we stumble over the pronunciation of France? <laughs> well, I just, France sounds posh, that's all. But okay. I'm, I'm happy to go with it. A bit of Francais? A bit of Francais. Okay. So um, we'll, we'll hear more. <laughs> <laughs> we will explore both the Pyrenees and the Alps. Uh, also in this episode, Sarah Bentz, a writer and blogger who's worked with multiple refugee and asylum seeker organisations, including Refugee Women's Centre in northern France. There's <laughs> Richard Valla. He's definitely a France guy. And he's not only a war surgeon but a mountaineer, and he introduces us to the GR5, which is a trek across the French Alps. We look at French cuisine and the Rhone, one of the major rivers of Europe, and travelling when you're overweight. <laughs> That's quite appropriate for travelling in France. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> What's your quiz question? Uh, obviously, French is the official language of France, or France. <laughs> <laughs> but where else is it the official language? I uh, will have the answer at the end of the show. Excellent. Kate O'Malley has written an article for us on the Mid-Pyrenees, and she and her partner Mark have been there a couple of times for extended periods as they house-sit their way around the world. The first time we went there, we sort of had an idea of what to expect, and when we got there... It was nothing like we had in our minds, wasn't it? It was a perfect one day, snowing the next. It was, it's an incredible little uh, part of France. Yeah, well, some of the places that you visited, um, you know, waterfalls and caves, let's pick your experiences uh, apart and tell us about those. The waterfalls in France. Have you ever been to, um, well, the best thing about France is the cheese. The best cheese in France is Rockford. And the best falls in France are, of course, the Rockford uh, Cascades. No, I haven't. I've been yeah. to France, but I haven't experienced anything outside of Paris, to be honest. Although I have eaten that cheese, and that is delicious. It is pretty good. Isn't I it? had to it put um, I had to put Mark on a, a limit. Well, every time we go to the Midi Pyrenees, because um, yeah, Rockford's not good for you in in large doses. <laughs> We'll be exploring that uh, idea of putting weight on uh, a little later in the podcast, but yeah, go ahead, Mark. I know the Rockford uh, Cascades are lovely. They're they're sort of tucked away in in the middle of nowhere, as far as nowhere you can go in in, in France. But there's a, just a little track. There's hardly any people, and you just go up. Everything's moss covered. The, the you know the, either the water's flowing, or we were lucky enough to be there when it was frozen. Mm. It's a photographer's dream. It's the perfect place for a picnic where if you were allowed to have some Rockford cheese, maybe some <laughs> wine, it's just a great day out. So what is it about the southwest of France for, for you? I think it's um, the area itself is, you know, it's quite undiscovered. Comparatively, like, to the rest of France, the... You know, the tourism there is not really that developed, I suppose. The hiking is amazing. The Well, Mark loves skiing, so that was always the initial appeal of it. Well, because the skiing is lovely there, of course the skiing is lovely. You know, it's, it's lovely everywhere in France. It's a little bit quieter there. It's actually a little bit cheaper there. You can get, you know, in some places the, the day ski passes are, are, are way less than what you'll, you'll pay up in the Alps. But you also have the advantages if you don't want to go skiing, there's so many other places you can go. There's so much good hiking, there's so much good food, and the the weather is just lovely. You get a nice fine day and 
you can just, you know, the hike, like to the hike to the Chateau. I'm going to pronounce this really badly again to the Chateau de Rocks Fixard. And it's. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like that? Do you like my French? You guys are on the right podcast. They've got like thousands, and, you know, of kilometres of hiking tracks, walking tracks. They're really organised walking tracks as well through just incredible landscapes. And the whole area is just, it's its a little bit more authentic, isn't it? It's its rustic. Everyone is French. You know, it's... Oh. Have you got us? Yeah, got you there. Uh, I just heard everyone is French, so yeah, I think Kate. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see like you can you can go on a holiday, and you'll be in a foreign city. You could be at home because you only hear people speaking English the yeah. whole time, you know. But yeah, I think the Midi Pyrenees is, is still for France is quite an anomaly because it's a little bit undiscovered. Um, it's the most probably undeveloped area of France as well. So as far as tourism goes, it is there, but it's not on the, the mass scale that you find in a lot more of the popular French destinations, if you like, even the ones that have that natural appeal. Um, so that's sort of what we like about it, isn't it? You know, there's just little villages, there's lots of hiking. You can walk from one village to the next, if you, you know, if you're that way inclined. Um, the food is amazing. It's yeah, well, we're going to get to that later in the, uh, <laughs> in the episode. Yeah, really, just a really de- sort of delightful part of France, isn't it? And you know what? Do you want to know which is the very best part? The Spanish bit. <laughs> 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 no, I'm just kidding. La Livia, the little Spanish enclave in the middle of France. Who would have thought? <laughs> there it is. You can you drive through this area and you come across this little town called La Livia, which I'm probably pronouncing Livia. Livia, <laughs> pronouncing it badly. And it actually belongs to Spain. The streets, everything is written in Spanish. The people speak Spanish. The food. The The food is Spanish. It's maintained by the Spaniards. And yet it's in the middle of France. But it's literally like one street to the next. You go, you're in France, and then the next block, you're in Spain. There's a little road between Livia. 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 (laughs) There's a little road between Livia and Spain. It's less than two kilometres. But they share it. Six months of the year, the Spaniards look after the road and six months of the year, the French look after the road. But it's the the lifeline or the umbilical cord. To Spain. They are such a fun couple and we'll get them back when we do our episode in 2019 on the Baltics. We'll have a link to their blog, Vagrants of the World, in show notes, plus Kate's story featuring that little piece of Spain in France. Richard Villa, Phil, is a freelance travel writer. He's also a war surgeon, an international mountain leader. And he's published books, blogs, periodicals, newspapers. Well, he's appeared in newspapers. He's done everything, including he has crossed the French Alps on foot, the walk to beat all others, he says. So podcast on France. Let's chat to him. I love talking to overachievers. Hello, Richard. (laughs) Hello uh, to to you both. An overachiever. That's unfair, isn't it, Richard? (laughs) I don't think I'm an overachiever at all, actually. I, I think life is a continuous ambition, isn't it? And uh, this seemed like a challenge one could not turn, a, t- turn away. Well, we'll get to the, your war, war surgeon days and what you feel comfortable um, answering a bit later. But 38,000 metres of climbing. And who did you do this with? This was a, a lifelong ambition in many respects. I'd had for many, many years this book on the GR5 stuck on a bookshelf behind me. And I'd always wanted to do it. I knew it was a very, very long distance. Uh, and then the opportunity arose because a colleague contacted me and said, could I walk with him part of the route, but not all of it? And I said, well, let's do the whole thing rather than just part of it. And so it went from that small week-long walk to one which took really uh, well over a month. There were two key people, myself and a chap called Milos, and then others came to join us at various points along the way. Okay. On the Richard Villa scale of difficulty, where was it for you? Was that a, was that a seven or is it a eight? I suppose it was probably a six or a seven. Uh, the route itself is a very long one. Um, but actually it's been very well thought out. I mean, my original thoughts were 
that somebody had just uh, looked at a map of Europe. They'd drawn a straight line from uh, Lac Le Mans, which is near to Geneva, down to the Mediterranean, and just said walk and sort of forget the mountains on the way. But <laughs> in reality, they'd, they, they'd thought it through very, very well indeed. And um, it's a, I think one thing stands out more than anything else, and that is that every day I walked, every morning we walked, you'd find something different. I, I don't quite know how it's possible to do a whole walk, and yet every day is different, but it is. Now, your mate, is he British ex-Special Forces along with yourself, or did you do it with two uh, he, ex-British, ex-British ex-Special Forces? Yeah, we, we, we were both uh, British ex-Special Forces. There you go, Phil. <laughs> well, this is why I said the Richard Villa scale of difficulty, because yes. for me, I, I'm going all spinal tap. I reckon that sounds like an 11. Yeah, exactly. So no, for, no. for someone no, like no, I would, I, would, I, I would have to disagree. I mean, I think it's a, it is a, it's a lovely walk, um, and many, many people do it. And, and as we were walking, it became very apparent. Yes, it's a challenging walk, but actually it's almost a pilgrimage. And it's, you're never thinking about reaching the end. In fact, the last thing I think you should do is think about reaching the end. What you do is just think about the next day. That's all the walk allows you to do. And even though it was a huge long walk from, for us and for me, um, and by any standards, I think a, a walk of that length is a long one. In actual fact, if you take the whole route, I mean, this was a route called the GR5, the Grand Rondonnet 5, um, it actually starts way up in, in the Netherlands somewhere. And so this portion, the bit that traverses the Alps, is actually only about a third of the total route itself, even though it's long. So is this a modern thing or is it an ancient route? I think the, the answer is it's, it's relatively modern in terms of uh, people walking it uh, like we were walking it. Um, but uh, the, the actual route is a sequence of individual routes that have been connected together, that have been knitted together, and each of them, uh, as it were, had a different function. They were trade routes or uh, passes going from one village to, to another. And it's now knitted together to form this thing called the GR5. Great. And what sort of people did you meet along the way? You name it, and we met them. And, and uh, there's a Swiss medicine guide who was recovering from heart surgery and who was doing the entire route in flip-flops. And uh, <laughs> I looked at this. <laughs> the, there was a what we call the superhuman Australian, I think. Um, and he was walking about twice the distance anybody else could walk in a day or so he said. I mean, you were relying, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's Australian. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's English too. Um, but uh, we were, you would rely on getting information from people you often met in the evenings and you'd discuss stories and exchange experiences. And um, if people were walking in the opposite direction to you, it was always good because you could find out what was are lying around the corner the next morning and there was this australian who basically declared he could walk 47 kilometers daily i guess you can do that i think i've done that a few times in my life but i would not do that daily um but he looked good he looked fit and he'd been walking over many long distance paths and the gr5 just happened to be one of them he, he should have um, been the one doing it in flip-flops what about the syrian illegal immigrants who spent six months yeah. avoiding capture What's interesting with this particular route, it basically parallels, in the northern part, it parallels the, the French-Swiss border, and in the southern part, it parallels the French-Italian border. Um, the whole route is basically in France, with a few little incursions into, into Switzerland and Italy as you go along. But basically, it's a French route. Um, they, the, the mountain passes that were used in World War II for people to escape from France, as it were, um, uh, have now become mountain passes where people enter France. And I guess illegally, uh, the, as you get further south, as you get down near towards the sea, it is very, very clear um, that these are routes being used by immigrants uh, illegally. It's a difficult one when you're a mountain walker because clearly one is not on the side of illegal immigration, but at the same time one knows there's a problem that has to be solved. Uh, and yet you meet these people in the hills. You meet them when they're short of water. You meet them when they're short of food. And at that point, they are no longer illegal people. They are people who are in trouble or who, who need to be helped. And so, yes, I did give water to people as they're walking the mountains. I did give some of my food to people because at that point, they were just simply fellow mountaineers. But there were some who traveled for a long, long way, a long, long way. 
um, uh, to to achieve what they were trying to achieve. Whether they achieved it, I simply do not know. We're going to touch on that actually a little later in the podcast, but I think it's a good time to segue into your war surgeon life. Um, and you've just come back from Gaza? Uh, as you know, I'm ex-military, and so I guess conflict is something with which I have dealt and disaster over many, many years. And um, uh, I am a surgeon in the United Kingdom, um, but I've been fortunate in traveling around the world. I worked with the UK disaster team on, on one occasion, and in fact, I actually worked alongside the Australians and the Philippines. You have a wonderful group in Australia called OSMAT, and I was I had the good fortune to walk along, work alongside them in the Philippines. Um, but yes, I have returned recently from Gaza, where I was working there with the Red Cross, um, and there's a lot of work for a surgeon to do, uh, far more more than would make one normally comfortable. Yeah, very true, Richard. I, in fact, I can't imagine what it must be like to be in a war zone. Uh, by the way, mm-hmm. love his accent. <laughs> love it. Uh, me too. And thanks for sharing the GR, GR5 with us, which is, are you ready? Mm. Grand Traverse des Alpes, <laughs> one of the top hikes in the French Alps. <laughs> You did. Uh, We've done that deliberately to me, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I always give you those things yep. to say. Um, just on the refugees, as you heard, Richard referred to those he encountered on the trek. But later in the episode, chatting to Sarah, who's volunteered with the Dunkirk Refugee Women's Centre, and they've been helping female refugees specifically in northern France. But, Phil, travel news. Um, okay. Now, there's a bit more evidence that it is possible to love a place to death. The village of Polinano Amare in Italy's Puglia region is charging tourists five euros to enter the old town centre. The village is a maze of cobbled streets, piazzas, whitewashed buildings and terraces with panoramic views. It actually was settled by the Greeks back in the 4th century, so it's absolutely teeming with history as well. But now you'll find some very modern turnstiles (laughs) at the entrance to the old town and you have to cough up the five euros to get through. What do you think of that? I think that's fair enough. Hey, but look, here's the news behind the news with that Italian town. Um, the village has started a Christmas lights display, which would look spectacular in this place, of course. And the entry fee also gets you some popcorn, a donut, and some fairy floss, as well as the lights. The mayor says the town booms in summer, obviously, because it's Amare, it's on the beach, uh, but it becomes a ghost town in winter. So they're trying to do this to encourage more tourists to come and to spread that wealth throughout the year. Not a bad idea. I think it's great. And I love Europe in the winter. Yeah. Absolutely. Look, if you're uh, looking to make your travel dollar go a little further, then my advice is you should study the foreign exchange markets. Look for currencies that are falling. Currencies like the poor old Argentinian peso, which has tanked 50% against the US dollar recently. This, of course, is very bad news for the Argentinians because it makes everything much more expensive. But for travellers, it's the opposite. You can tuck into some of that grass-fed beef that they have there, a <laughs> bargain price. price. Uh, and the currency sump has led to a 12% surge in visits to Argentina uh, in recent months. So start reading the business pages, look for where you can get a bargain. Great idea. Uh, speaking of Christmas lights, uh, it, Christmas is just around the corner. And if you're lucky, looking to make the most of the holidays by jetting off to somewhere, you've missed the boat, or the plane, I should say, when it comes to securing a cheap ticket. Prices start to skyrocket. Uh, another, did you get that? Yeah, intended punt I rider. Didn't have <laughs> <out>. <laughs> In about a month before Christmas. But if you're really dead keen to travel, then you should travel on Christmas Day or New Year's Day. Because that's the reason people travel. They want the holiday yeah, when they get somewhere. Great idea. So nobody's travelling. Lots of empty seats, which means the prices are pretty cheap as well. You don't get to spend the holiday with anybody, but you get to go where you want to go. (laughs) Now, we all enjoy a big breakfast, mushrooms, bacon, tomato and egg, but a cafe in San Diego has taken the fry up to the next level and Instagram shots of the plates are going viral on social media. The provisional kitchen at 425 Fifth Avenue in San Diego serves up an ostrich egg as the centrepiece of the breakfast. And one ostrich egg, it's the equivalent to 16 chicken eggs. That's a lot of protein. And Yes, it is, and that's a big breakfast. It's also going to set your back of big bucks as well, 75 US dollars. Oh, would you do it? Not for 75 US dollars, (laughs) I wouldn't. I also don't need 16 eggs. 
I'm pretty happy with just one chicken egg. Thanks yeah, very much. Thank you. A couple of those on a bit of toast. Yeah. Thanks for that, Phil. No worries. Hello World. It's a travel agency in Australia and they've just announced or launched a TV show focusing on destinations around the world. And an Australian comedian named Vince Sorrenti is one of the presenters and is just back from filming an episode on France. G'day. Nice to be with you guys. Well, we reached out to chat to you specifically because our episode is on France and we'd noticed for Hello World TV you have been to France for an episode. I don't know how many uh, people I had to pay off to get that, but I got it. Italy, France is my area. We and are... yes, France was fantastic. Your uh, Italian background, though, that's probably why you got that gig. Uh, well, I, I, hope, I, hope it, I hope it finally came in handy one day, yes. So what do you make of France? Oh, it was fantastic. Look, I've been to France many times, and uh, I've been to just the, I, I'd been to Paris and the Riviera many, many times, but I'd never been um, up the Rhone River like we did on this trip, and uh, I hadn't been to some of these parts of Paris that I'd been to on this trip. Also peculiar with my stories is the food element. So uh, I got to meet some wonderful food people over there and visit some food locations. We went to a truffle farm, an olive oil farm in Provence. Uh, We went to some amazing uh, foodie stores in Paris on that, uh, on Rue Montaguil, which sort of has incredible cheese shops and pastry stores and and uh, uh, chocolatiers. <laughs> I had to put on a few kilos for the team on this <laughs> tour. It was, uh, it was wonderful, mate. And we, this cruise up the Rhone River um, through uh, Provence was... It was just gorgeous. I mean, I can't, I can't believe I'm... I can't believe I'm giving it a wrap. And the real beauty of the river cruising is you go right into the middle of a town, pull into Avignon. Most towns are built on rivers, so when you pull up at a town in the river, you're in the middle of the town. It's fantastic. And how good's Avignon? I've been there. I think it's beautiful. I've got to say, I, look, I, I, I'm an architect in the past life, too, oh. so I'd always want to do, uh, see some of the medieval buildings of Avignon and the Palace of the Popes, uh, most noteworthy of all. But it's a great town. The centre of Avignon is this big walking street with just bustling outdoor cafes and brasseries and rest. I really loved it, and it's very pretty too. The river itself lends it just a real serenity. And some great places within short hops of Avignon too, like um, the Pont du Gard, which is this amazing Roman bridge. The Romans, man, they did some incredible stuff. This bridge carried an aqueduct on it to service this town of uh, Garon, right? It travels 50 kilometres and drops 13 metres over that time to let the water flow. But these Romans are off another planet. It was, and you can you consider the fact that most of the medieval stuff in this area was being built in the 1300s. And this stuff was already, you know, 1,500 years old. It's just mind-blowing what these Romans were doing. So anyway, the south of France is... Beautiful. I cannot recommend it enough. And the food, of course, was incredible. I'm a big fan of French food. They're they're, they're very proud of it, aren't they? Aren't they? They're cuisine. They, I think that's the big difference between French and Italian food. The French the French really cook to show off. I mean, the Italians cook to eat. You know, Italian food is kind of more down to earth, more sort of uh, user friendly. Whereas the French are very extravagant about their food. They cook to sort of... Cooking is a real expression to the French. They, they formalised cooking and made it, made it an art. There you go. And super rich too. I love all those sort of cheesy sauces. Yum. It, it's astonishing that they eat so much cheese and cream and butter and yet they've got one of the lowest sort of rates of heart disease in all of Europe. I think it's all the red wine they drink too that counteracts it. I, I'd say it's one of the greatest places in the world. It is beautiful. Thanks, Vince. Now, both he and Mark earlier mentioned the weight you can put on travelling. Well, Rob Goldstone is a journalist who wrote an article for the New York Times where at 285 pounds and 5 feet 7 inches, he gets straight to the point. Yep, the tricks and trials of travelling while fat. Um, (laughs) Hello. Um, It's good to be having this conversation. Um, Not least because I wrote this because so many people I knew had kind of almost set in secret to me. It became like almost like a secret society of people that I noticed while I was traveling. 
that would kind of come up to me and say things like, are you okay? Is it all right? And I would look at them like, are they crazy? Like, what are they talking about? And the more it went on and on, I was like, aha. So it's because I'm doing things like asking for a seatbelt extender, which is one of my first tricks when I when I get on a flight. Now, actually, living in America, there's so many people that are plus size or overweight or just simply fat, to like or mouse or fat, that um, there aren't enough seatbelt extenders sometimes on a plane. And I worked out early on that I suppose if you can't fasten the seatbelt and if they've given out all these seatbelt extenders, I suppose the next logical thing is they throw you off the plane. So as, as I open my article with, the first thing I do when I get on a plane is do this little routine. It's almost like a secret society where I kind of nod at the flight attendant, point to my stomach, and then they know they kind of secretively nod back. And a little bit later, they wander over and very secretively hand you this thing, which is a seatbelt extender. But they pass it off as if it's a kind of, it's almost like some Mexican drug deal. Like it's very <laughs> weird. And so it's like they don't want people to know and you sort of don't want people to know. And it, it's just very bizarre. But, you know, um, what, what I do notice is that the airlines all the time write about extra leg room and seats with extra leg room and how much room there is. But the last time I checked, people weren't getting taller. They were kind of getting a bit rounder. <laughs> yes. So, you know, here to the airline, the next airline that says, we've decided to give you a couple of inches more room in the width. And because we've decided you're not more than six feet. 10, chances are, <laughs> you don't need a bit more leg room. Where possible, if, if I'm traveling in, in coach and economy, I'll buy an, an extra seat if I can, or I'll beg them to try and put me somewhere where there's an extra seat. But even that can backfire. I, I was in Brazil, and I was on a domestic flight. It was a very short flight from Sao Paulo to Rio, and the flight wasn't particularly expensive, and so I bought an extra seat. Well, Everything was fine, except there was uh, an equipment change of the plane, and sometimes when that happened, they reassigned all the seat numbers. So when I checked in, I had two completely separate seat numbers. <laughs> and I can't remember them exactly, but it was like, you know, 23A and 26E. And I was like, oh, no, 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 this doesn't work like that. And they couldn't stand it out. Now, maybe because everyone's beautiful in Brazil, but they would never ever have an, even an extra pound. <laughs> in Australia, they're very well aware. In the UK, they're well aware. In, in Europe, they're well aware. When you go to some places, um, I say in my article, I, I went to Vietnam. I came through immigration, and they looked through my form, and the lady immigration said to me, oh, how many kilos you weigh? And I thought, oh, wait, I've missed me out. And I said, oh, is that on the form? And she was, no, just curious. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I smiled well, but then when I told her, she said to me, don't take rickshaw, it will turn over. <laughs> Some people will say, we'll just lose weight. Well, that's a brilliant idea. But it probably isn't going to happen before you have to go on your next flight. So you have to come up with ideas. Uh, to deal with it in other ways. Rob Strix in show notes. Now, Sarah Bentz has worked with multiple refugee and asylum seeker organisations, including Refugee Women's Centre in northern France. Now, the, given the country, Phil, and it's no secret, it's often in the news with stories mm. of riots and yep. refugee crisis, and Richard mentioned running into refugees in the French Alps, I wanted to hear more about her experience. So I volunteered with an organisation called... Um, the Dunkirk Refugee Women's Center, or RWC, as we often refer to it. And it's basically an international coalition of women helping refugee women. And by helping refugee women, they also assist with children and unaccompanied minors and just family units in general. Um, so the charity is entirely run by women. It is primarily, I would say, French and English women um, who volunteer for the charity. But I'm American. And when I was working there, there are some women from Germany and Austria and all over the world. People come and volunteer for R RWC. 
Well, earlier in the podcast, we spoke to Richard Vella, who had trekked across the French Alps, and he talked about a few of the characters that he'd met. Richard touched on um, meeting refugees. There is a big issue with refugees in France, isn't there, in general? Yes, definitely. And that's primarily in northern France, at least, is where the big refugee camps are. Um, well, unofficial refugee camps. And that is mostly due to the Channel, which is an underground, underwater tunnel that connects France to England. And refugees, um, asylum seekers, kind of congregate in that area because they're trying to cross over to England. So why aren't the camps official? (laughs) That's a really good question. And it has a very complicated answer that I don't, I couldn't even begin to tell you the answer to it because there's so many different threads of politics in that. But that is um, due to the French and English government's uh, Dunkirk refugee camp. So there's a big group in Calais and then a few miles away, there's another big group in Dunkirk. The one in Dunkirk used to be official. Um, I forget the exact dates. It's in the article I wrote, Um, but I think it was like, 2015 to 2016, it was official and it was sanctioned by the French government and lots of big charities like Médecins Sans Frontières was there. Um, But in, I believe it was in April 2016, the camp burned down and the French government after that kind of took away its official sanctioning of the camp. Um, A bunch of the big charities like Médecins Sans Frontières left, but the problem was that the refugees all stayed. You specifically were working with the Kurdish Iraqi refugees. Um, you say yeah, in your article, they yeah, they were living in the in the forest previously, mm-hmm. um, home to that first refugee camp. So, what was it like for those women? It's it's hard to describe, especially coming from my perspective, like as an outsider. But the the camp there, I'll use the word camp, even though it's not official, is majority male. It's extremely muddy. They have one meal a day. There's police kind of regularly doing evictions. So coming and taking away their belongings, um, destroying them, sometimes tear gassing the tents so they can't use them again. It's an extremely, I don't know what the right word is, but it's, it's an environment that's constantly changing. And For a woman in particular, it makes them extremely vulnerable, not only to um, issues like sexual assault, but so much more. Just, you know, if you can imagine living in a forest with only the clothes on your back, no access to a public toilet or shower, constantly having your things taken away from you, um, being intimidated by police, it's it's a horrible situation. In your article, you kick it off with um, mentioning that you'd been asked to pack diapers and straight away I assumed mm-hmm. they'd be for the children, but they were for the women. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We had to pack um, adult diapers, adult nappies for women because if you can imagine it being dark at night, there's the mafia, there's different gang groups, there's tons of men, just even men that you don't know. Um, especially coming from a more conservative culture, the fear of leaving their tent was so extreme that the women would be asking for adult diapers to wear so they wouldn't have to leave their tent to go to the bathroom during the night. Wow. I would have thought, you know, men, women, children, all in the same situation, there'd be this feeling of solidarity, but that's not the case. I think in some aspects there is a feeling of solidarity. Um, There's some really beautiful moments that happen, at least um, from the refugee women's perspective, when you're there and the children are all playing together and the women are um, talking in English together, having lessons, helping each other out. There's definitely moments of solidarity. Um, Families, people who didn't know each other before are helping each other out, specifically, um, I think, families with young children, the children play together. So there are wonderful moments like that but in the end um they're trying to reach the uk the majority of people are trying to reach the uk and um a lot of people will just do what they have to do in that kind of situation it's um it's not like a normal social environment like we can 
even imagine or we've ever experienced in our lives. How would people <laughs> um, help out with that organization financially if you're not able to on the ground? Yeah, there are so many ways to help out with Refugee Women's Centre. If you go to their Facebook page or their website, um, there is a link to, uh, I believe it's a GoFundMe that is constantly running that you can donate to. They've also got a Google Doc um, that is updated every few weeks where they have specific donation items that they need. They have an Amazon wish list too. So if you don't want to just um, donate money, you can donate specific items. You can, especially if you're in France or England or somewhere in Europe, you can um, collect donations of the items on that list and donate those. A lot of people, um, what is actually really helpful in the summertime is there were people who would go around to music festivals and pick up the tents that were left and they would send those over to Refugee Women's Center because tents and tarps are like the number one item that they need. Um, so there's lots of ways if you can't physically go to France and volunteer. There are so many ways you can help. Well, look, great story. As I said, we will share it in show notes. Sarah, thanks for chatting. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That brings us to the end of our episode on France, France, but not before the answer to your quiz question. <laughs> Obviously, French is the official language of France, France, <laughs> but where else is it the official language? The answer is, in order of size, Canada, Belgium and Switzerland. But Africa as a continent has more French speakers than anywhere else in the world, places like Senegal and uh, Cote d'Ivoire and places like that with the Democratic Republic of the Congo has got 31 million French speakers in there. Wow. So. so do you know off the top of your head if that is the international language? It is second after English um, as far as languages go and that's mostly because of the African nations that do it. But their, their French there is not like native spoken French, it's it's kind of mixed up with the African languages as well. So it's a variation of it. A bit like, you know, Creole would be in the United States as well. It's kind of based on French, but has, you know, taken on the local flavour as well. And all of that just off the top of your head. Thanks, mate. <laughs> You can get in touch with us by emailing podcast at worldnomads.com. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and download the Google Podcast app or ask Alexa and Google Home Play to play the World Nomads podcast. Uh, next week, another amazing nomad who's travelled 23,500 kilometres overland from Adelaide in Australia to London. The World Nomads podcast. Explore your boundaries.